lovely to see so many of you here. Um, and uh, yeah, great, great to be here. And um, welcome is the first thing I wanted to say. And welcome, especially in the week or a fortnight that we've just had. Um, if you're anything like me, I think the, uh, the external environment has been quite a troubling uh, and distracting sort of noise in the background to uh, the kind of work that lots of us are doing in our day jobs um, and probably one that feels quite depressing. Um, perhaps we'll get into this a little, a little bit um, in, in our conversations. But anyway, I, I wanted to just acknowledge that because what we're hoping we can do over the next um, hour or two is create a space, an opportunity for kind of nourishment and hope. Uh, in, in that somewhat turbulent um, kind of external environment. So it's really wonderful to have lots of you here. Um, this is um, the first uh, Emerging Futures gathering. Um, and I think I just wanted to start by acknowledging, um, A, thank you for your interest, and B, um, welcome to the journey. Um, we are not entirely sure how this might evolve um, and see that as a good thing. We want it to be shaped by all of you um, as much as us. Um, and so um, really what we are doing today, um, and, and we'll get into a bit more of the detail of, of how, how our time together is going to work, but what we want to do today is open up a conversation um, about um, what it means to be uh, working collectively on, on some shared um, ambitions, I suppose. Um, and uh, we have um, some brilliant speakers joining us, as Susie said, um, but also lots and lots of time for all of us to meet and talk in smaller groups um, as, as we go. And um, we will wrap up by two, um, just to build on what Susie said, do, if you need to take time out, please do that. Um, you're free to come and go as you wish, but hopefully uh, you'll be so engaged and stimulated in the conversation, you'll be able to stay all the time. Um, if you're anything like me, um, you'll be wondering who else is in the room. And um, so I just quickly want to introduce um, uh, uh, some of the people behind um, the, 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 the work um, that's led to today. Um, so Victoria and Seppi are both on the call. They are uh, from JRF. So hi, Victoria and hi, Seppi. Um, and we also have Susie, uh, Mona and Rachel, um, who together form the wonderful uh, design collective Iris and Birch. And they've been working with us to think about what, what might this community of practice be and how might it emerge. And they will be uh, holding the space with us today. So um, really big thank you to them for all the work they've done to get us to um, the first of these events. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to say a little bit about um, JRF's own perspective on emerging futures before we get into a uh, the detail of what we're doing today. Um, and just, I guess, to provide some context, I think lots of you may have signed up quite a while ago. And um, back in April, we published a paper um, thinking about what is Emerging Futures and why might it be important to an organisation uh, like Joseph Brownshee Foundation, whose mission has been to solve poverty. We've been around 100 years been kind of uh, very present in research and campaigning work to try and tackle poverty. But it, it kind of, I guess, the, 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 the starting point for the Emerging Futures work um, was, was a recognition that um, we've done all this work and yet we're in a situation where poverty is going up. Deep poverty is growing, child poverty is growing. Um, you're seeing these rising inequalities and all in the context of these kind of shifting sands um, of climate crisis and aging population, um, new forms of platform capitalism that we have no idea how to regulate or organize ourselves around. And so this sort of sense that injustice is showing up in many different ways that actually are the kind of tools and approaches of the 20th century and the sort of techniques of anti-poverty organizations like JRF may not be quite sufficient to respond um, to, to the sorts of challenges we face. Um, and um, so the way we've been thinking about this work at JRF, and I'm really keen to hear more about where other people are on this, is that, yes, we need to do the urgent work of holding this government in particular, holding their feet to the fire, challenging them to not do terrible things like not uprating benefits, um, you know, taxing, taxing the poor effectively uh, to, to benefit the rich and so on. Um, we absolutely need to be doing that, doing everything we can to ameliorate the worst impacts of poverty today. But if we only do that and don't make space for this deeper work, which is about reimagining social and economic systems for a world uh, that is more just, more equitable, designed for a place to be a place where people and planet can thrive and live in harmony, um, then we will not really be speaking to the original mission of, of the organization. Uh, Joseph Roundtree described um, that, that being to tackle social evils. 
Um, so um, that, that's kind of that was our starting point. I think it's really important, though. It's very easy when you when you start talking about emerging futures and needing to build these alternatives. So not just resist and challenge, but to build alternatives in, in, in reality. It's easy to start to get into this idea that what we need is a vision or a blueprint. And that isn't at all where we are. I think instead what we want to do with the emerging futures work is to sort of expand the field of possibilities. And in many ways, I think people on this call today <laughs> represent um, those possibilities in action. And part of what we want to do is to say, how can we tell those stories, raise the awareness and um, connect you up and build this kind of movement of people who are imagining the future already and trying to build it today um, and draw out from that what it might mean for what we need to invest in and resource differently um, for tomorrow. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, I'm very happy to get into more detail about, about uh, what that translates into. Um, but broadly speaking, we will be launching a new transitions fund, um, but uh, that will be early next year. We also want to continue this really important work we think around convening, bringing people together, growing a sort of sense of movement and resilience and agency amongst people who are trying to build the new among the old, if you like. And so I think that that kind of field building and the learning that goes alongside the funding is going to be really, really important. So um, on to these events specifically and, and, and why we're doing them. Um, so I think uh, the first thing to say is because there was a demand. <laughs> um, so um, we've had um, like a really... Um, wonderful um, uh, response to invitations to express an interest in the work and not only I think were people are people interested in funding opportunities although that is obviously an important part um, of, 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 of it but also um, people in, 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 the, in your um, responses to the survey thank you so much by the way for taking the time to, to respond to that um, there was a sense of wanting to have a space to share and to build solidarity. And that, that insight and that feedback has really sort of shaped the way we are thinking about, um, about these sessions. Um, and today is the first of three initial events that we're going to be running. Um, uh, really, in all three events, we want to explore both ways of working and kind of important themes uh, in the emerging future space. So today's focus is on collective working, more on that in a second. The second session, um, and I'm just going to do a little plug for the other, the other two sessions now, do please come to them if you're interested. The second session will be looking um, at learning and collective intelligence as something that seems important in this field. And then on a kind of more content focus, looking at the issue of ownership, which again is something that's come through very clearly as a kind of shared theme and shared uh, area of inquiry for lots of you uh, and the work that you're doing. Uh, the third session will then look at risk. Uh, and uncertainty and the kind of, I guess, the challenges of working in a more speculative way, which again feel like an important defining feature of emerging futures work. And then again, taking more of a contents lens and um, looking at new economic thinking. I know some of you on the call will be uh, right in the thick of that and others for others, it will feel newer. Um, and so um, it's, I guess, creating a space to kind of think together about that. And really what's behind all three of these sessions is it's a chance to sort of scaffold a conversation uh, uh, between you um, and well, between all of us um, and to create um, what we hope would be really inviting conditions for knowledge exchange and mutual support. So that's really what we're trying to do. Um, just uh, so I, I meant to say earlier when I was introducing the JRF and the RS and Birch team, I should, I'm sorry, I should have also um, said who, who else is in the room. Um, you'll have a chance to meet, uh, meet others on the call um, uh, in, in breakout groups. But just, just to give you a flavour of the overall picture, um, we know this from, from the survey that you responded to. So you work in a wide range of organisations. We've got universities, charities, uh, non-government organisations, government funding bodies, non-profit organisations, think tanks and corporates. Um, so a really wide range. Um, the majority of you have some kind of interest in systems change and futures thinking in collectives and imagination. Um, but actually, uh, within that, your work spans a whole range of different areas from uh, climate, housing, social justice, education, care. So it's a really wonderfully mixed group of people um, with bringing a kind of huge depth um, and range of experience. Um, and uh, I think the other thing to say is some of you uh, feel very deeply embedded in emerging futures work. Some of you, I think, will probably have heard me just talking just now and think, yeah, kind of, I get all this. 
uh, whereas others of you are kind of interested and curious but maybe don't feel so um, familiar with the work and I just wanted to be really clear that that is you are very very welcome wherever you are <laughs> in that in that in that spectrum um, and that actually what we what is really important that we do together is 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 kind of recognize that this is a journey for all of us um, with that in mind, um, we, um, we have created a glossary, um, which I think we're going to put in the chat uh, in, in a minute. Um, part of being on a journey is creating tools and materials to help us all find our way and to navigate the territory. Um, and uh, so one of the themes that's come up um, sort of on a regular basis uh, in this work is around language. On the one hand, the way it can be very exclusionary, but on the other hand, how using familiar language can pull us back to frames of reference that aren't helpful. And I think this is a tension we, we sort of have to navigate. Um, so we are, we, we've sort of started to develop a, a glossary and really invite you, if in these conversations there are kind of words or phrases um, that you're unfamiliar with, please like ask. Um, get 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 into a conversation with the others in your group um, and perhaps uh, add to the glossary because we want this to be a kind of collective and living document um, and uh, the idea is to make everything more navigable and transparent for everybody. Um, in that spirit um, I'm going to finish with a with with a question that I've been grappling with and you know we'll, we'll, we'll I hope um, everyone will feel able to bring their questions uh, to, to, to the conversations today. Um, and it's a question that I turn over again and again in my mind, really, and 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 I have I've really felt it quite viscerally um, in the last couple of weeks, which is how how can we help each other stay focused on the deep shifts, the deep work that's needed when it feels like the house is burning down around us? How how can we do that? How can we stay focused on that? Um, I, I don't know about you. I've I've had moments in the last couple of weeks where I've just wanted to go out and march. Um, or kind of scream at the government or, or you know, it's just, it's, it, there's this sort of desire for action. And, um, and actually, in some ways, I think there's a risk that, that pulls you into a trap of kind of perpetuating and, and, and maintaining the status quo. So how can we stay focused on the deep work? Recognising it is also urgent, right? Because climate crisis, we haven't got very long. But how do we stay focused on the deep work? How do we help each other? So that is my question. And on that, I'm going to hand back to Susie. That is a great question. Um, one of my team, that's the first time I heard that too. Um, one of the Iris and Birch team, can we put a version of that into the chat so that we've got that there and people can reference it? Um, right, because we are, as um, Sophia has said so eloquently, a group of people who, many of whom have not met each other, in fact, would not really have any uh, reason to be in a room with each other. The first thing we're going to do is split off into tiny groups Tony breakouts, threes or fours, uh, and have a 10 minute conversation with each other about who we are and why we're here. They're your two questions to deal with in that group. Who, you, who are you and why are you here? It's really just a chance to start conversation moving, to start to build rapport a little bit and to connect with one another. We'll then come back in and we've got, um, I'll maybe say hi to Annette, Annette maybe wave, um, and uh, Lorna and Katie, who are gonna do three short provocations for us that also end in a key question. And then we'll do some deeper conversations around those key questions. But for now, we're gonna break out into completely automated rooms. I don't know who's gonna end up with who, uh, groups of three or four, and just introduce yourself to each other. Say hi, and we'll see you back in here in about 10 minutes. Mona, that's your cue. <laughs> So I didn't automatically invite all of you in. So if there's any of you who want a break before you speak, you can choose to, or I can uh, add you to a group if you want. So that's... Uh, I have a one minute thing, then I'll be back in a sec. I'm happy to join your group. Okay, I will add you into a... Oh, I've got Helen and Jake back here. Hi, Helen. Hi, Jake. Did you get pinged out like in some weird Zoom I, uh, meta portal? Um, <laughs> I got I got um, assigned to talk to the person that I talk to several times a day every day. 
Um, so I wonder if I could go in a different group, please. I mean, you know, I really like her and everything. And what, are great, what are the chances? What are the chances? What group were you in? Because then I will assign you to... Oh, another. I don't know the number. Hannah McDowell was in there. That's Okay, that's I will I try to assign you to another one. Thank you. I hope this is working. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's brilliant. And then we've got Helen. Helen, did you come back in? Because you didn't want to talk to the people you were talking to. No response. And Lydia? Yeah, I'm joining from uh, the Center for Public Impact. Great. And did you get put into a breakout room just then and get pinged out of the breakout room? Or should we put you in one just now? I, I can be put in one. <laughs> okay, great. I will assign you to one room here. Enjoy. Helen did say she was disappearing for 25 minutes, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she did. Uh, that was great, Sophia. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pause recording. I'm going to pause recording while we're talking here. Room. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Did you all meet people you'd not met before? We had one person come back in and say, no, I'm in a room with someone who I work with every single day. Please change my room. <laughs> Thanks, I algorithm. I fell out of my group. I think I was group eight. Help. Can you put me back in? Oh, oh do it you want to be oh, in? Is it over? It's over. It's oh, over. no, man. Come oh. back. Were you having a good conversation? What were you talking about? I shouldn't eavesdrop. It's terrible. I was about to hear something that I needed to know, but um, or being asked a question that I wanted to know the answer to that I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> Cool. Right. OK, well, that's one thing. That's one action to take out of this session. Bonnie has to find her room outside of this session and answer the question. We'll just wait for the, all the others to come back in and then I will take us into the next phase. Do you know, I don't think I will ever get used to the Zoom breakout thing, to being hurtled through time and space. Yeah, what is the meaning of life for me? Very good. Um, I don't think I will ever get used to being hurtled through time and space like that, ever. No matter how long I spend going from breakout rooms, it just feels so wrong to be thrown around like that without choice. Um, anyway, hello, we're back. Um, so this is the main section of the day. We're about to kick off the big it. Um, I'm really excited to have three totally brilliant people here with us. Um, I'll introduce you to them in a moment. They have been given a massive 10 minutes each to talk about really huge subjects, <laughs> which is really unfair of us. Um, so really, you're going to get an entry point from them. They, they could talk, all of them could talk for days about the work that they do, but they've got 10 minutes. So we're going to get these mini provocations kind of um, flash keynotes from them and they're, what they're trying to do is open up the room for us to have a conversation they're trying to land some questions so that we can then take some of those materials and tools that they're working with and uh, take in our in groups that we'll go out into afterwards take their questions and work with them and deepen them and work out how we want to as groupings of people um, understand this idea of collective working. Um, a reminder that when they're speaking, you can change your view. If you want to focus just on one place, do that. If you want to see how people are responding, go out into gallery. Um, I'm going to reiterate that we know that there are some language problems in this space. Uh, we are really, really keen for you all to flag when you hear a word or a model or a reference or a whatever framework that you've never heard of before say I don't know what that is in the chat use the chat um, tell us that there needs to be a bit of defining done around something and we will do that in real time in the tools that we're developing uh, and hopefully all support each other to learn together and um, if you don't know something it means that there's an opportunity for us all to be either communicating better or learning more together so let's please use that as texture to work with um, 
I think you've had the link for the glossary, which we will put in the chat again. There's also a reference library. So we're building, and Rachel will put that link in, I think, too. We're building a library of everything we hear today and in the other sessions and in the survey where we can. Um, things that uh, articles or authors or projects or programs that people reference that you all might find useful and want to return to. So there'll be a gloss, uh, reference library that you can all use as and when you want to over time. Um, so we're focusing on the collective today. We're looking at all sorts of things, collective organizing, collective action, uh, collective imagination, collective intelligence. And th this is what we hear coming up over and over and over again in the work we're doing. And I think a lot of you in the work that you're doing. And um, there's a consensus, I think, that to build towards the futures that we need to get to, to get through this complexity, which is essentially what transition work is, is moving through complexity. Um, we need to be able to act collectively as an organism but the siloed ways of working have become dysfunctional they're not creating the knowledge that we need in order to be able to shift uh, so how do we build and uh, move the gears move move the dial really together um, and that is what we're exploring today each of the speakers that speaks will give us a key question at the end remember that question we'll put it in chat too but remember it this is what's going to scaffold the conversations afterwards Okay, enough from me. Uh, Annette is our first speaker. Um, Annette works at an organization called Dark Matter Labs. Um, Dark Matter are, so Dark Matter um, have different ways of describing themselves. The one I'm going with today <laughs> um, is they're a not-for-profit who design and build the underlying infrastructure to support a new civic economy. Within that, Annette focuses on how we build distributed, democratic, collaborative, and beautiful, and that's really important, beautiful ways of working together for the transitions ahead of us. Um, Annette's looking at what is a collective. So, so what we mean when we say the word collective, and I'm gonna hand over to you. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, right, let me start by getting my screen share going. Uh, hopefully you can all, all see this in the background. Um, yes, I'm uh, Annette Dami from Dark Matter Labs. I'm really delighted to be here and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what is a collective. Um, I mean, I'm not a scholar on this, so I'm gonna just share some, some insights and thoughts and reflections from the work that myself and wider and dark matter labs have been doing this um, over various years um, and I'm going to take some some kind of liberties at the beginning here to kind of share my interpretation of the question of collective when I'm talking about it um, you know you you can think of collectives also as sort of groups of shared behavior like queues or riots or mobs or um but I'm going to, to lean on to think that in this context that we're talking about, I think generally when we're thinking about collectives, um, we're talking about when we come together for a shared endeavour. Um, and when I started thinking about that, I started thinking about all the different sort of types and examples um, that were coming to mind about how we come together in collective. Um, and here's just like a few different sort of types of collective that came to mind when I was thinking about it obviously there are many and I'm sure across this group we could probably crowdsource sort of hundreds if not thousands of, of examples um but it was making me think about different types um from let's say uh the donor economics peer learning journey perhaps somebody at some point might be speaking about that because that's a program from from this year um bring together kind of peer-led groups from around the world um, who have been thinking about the ideas of, of donor economics, um, one for the glossary, um, and how that can come to life across uh, neighbourhoods around the world. Um, really different type of collective to say the Plymouth Alliance, um, which you know is a is an alliance between seven different organisations in Plymouth um, who have got a single contract from Plymouth City Council um, who can operate together. Uh, to coordinate the complex needs system, uh, support system in Plymouth, so that people experiencing that support can get the right help that they need at the right time, and those organisations can collectively organise to deliver that. Um, then you've got examples like, um, you know, let's say the Black Friday Partnership, um, a really interesting example of bringing multiple different actors 
in a place together around a really systemic um, issue. So working with statutory agencies and voluntary organizations addressing structural barriers that prevent black people from thriving um, in Lambeth and beyond. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, there's a few others in here as well, like uh, Occupy Sandy or um, Somad here, for example, like lots of different types of ways that uh, and examples of, of uh, how we build collectives um, and the role that they play. And I quite like this tool from um, Tamaric Institute um, about like different forms of, of collaboration, reminding us that collectives can, can really span the range between just groups that are sharing information together and networking with each other and building upon each other's kind of like uh, learning base through to fully integrating um, the work that they do, planning together, you know, co-funding together, et cetera. And um, all of these different forms are needed in different types of spaces. Um, I often think about the different types in terms of the spectrum of uh, what I would think of as bounded versus unbounded. So bounded groups that have um, more barriers to entry and exit, um, and more regulation around what it means to be accountable, what commitments you're making um, when you go into a collective together. And often we'll find that when um, there's, there's resource that's going in and more time going into a piece of work together, we start to see these kind of more bounded ways of organizing start to kind of form, um, like into organizations or into formal partnership structures. Um, and then on the other end, you have these kind of more unbounded types of organizing, which might have fewer barriers and therefore people can enter and exit more readily. Um, that they, you know, they ha might have different ways that they can engage with that and options and can manage themselves through in and out of that space more, more easily. Um, and this whole plethora of different types of collectives in the middle. Um, and, you know, again, just named a couple here of different types, whether that's communities of practice um, or unions or the, the team at Huddlecraft would say about their huddles, you know, like purposeful pop-up peer groups, they, they call that, um, networks. Um, and I find the spectrum of this really interesting, including what they can learn between them, um, particularly among the more bounded groups, which a lot of our civic organizing also sits in. Um, and how we can learn to, um, as we do have more resource and time going towards some of the questions, um, learn from some of the more unbounded ways of organizing and how we and how we organize ourselves um, so that we are enabling a lot more movement in and out of our work. Um, the reason that's important in my perspective, um, sort of I'll, I'll go back to some of the questions that we're looking at in DM and what we've been learning about them um so if we we're very much thinking about what are some of the what are some of the big transitions that we need to be making um if we want to have a chance of a just viable future um and the time scale on that is urgent um and so if we know we need to retrofit 26 million or so homes in the uk or double the size of an urban tree canopy in a range of cities um, or restore the health of soil across an entire area of landscape um, or you know redesign the land economy uh, and the structures of land ownership so that we have a chance of secure affordable housing what does that actually mean um, and you know the more that we've looked about into this over over the years we've seen the whole layers of system change that that's going to require across so many different actors, um, across through finance instruments, through to policy, through to regulation within institutions, across how we govern, across how we organise. There is going to be no one organisation or one group that could possibly achieve the depth and the scale of the shifts that we need to see to achieve some of those changes that we know are going to be critical um, and it's going to invite us into a type of collective organizing that I might argue we haven't really developed the craft for yet so 
are structures of organizations and institutions that tend to be formed around hierarchical kind of top-down um, quite control-based uh, mechanisms that aren't really set up to inherently collaborate well and to co cooperate and be a collective well uh, just aren't gonna cut the mustard or for want of a better phrase is that the phrase <laughs> um, so how are we going to develop this craft of collective making you know it, it is one of the questions on on my mind like recognizing that it's not just about bringing people together you know it's not just about saying oh here's a thing right let's go do it like there's a there's a craft to how we develop that and I think that some of the speakers coming after me will will speak to some of those crafts um and uh, probably also will, will really draw us upon some beautiful areas of the cultural craft to that as well you know how do you how do you set an intention together? How do you make an invitation to that intention together? How do you make sense make and build trust and build accountability between each other? Um, one of the questions that I'm particularly interested in is how do we build the crafts that sit underneath that, the kind of structural capabilities in the systems, if you will, or like the technical kind of pieces um, that won't undermine those collectives and the, the culture of collective making at the point when say some resource comes into that system and we have to start deciding who the funds are going to go to and how much are people going to get and what's going to be the terms of the contract who owns the IP who gets to use the data um, what's the legal structure going to be uh, who's going to be liable if it doesn't work for example you know all of these questions that sit underneath that currently the existing contracts and structures that we have are still set up so that it's you know owned by one actor um people are going to be liable to the actors in power um you know that there's like a a, a, a value-based system around money that isn't going to be fit for the type of uh, collectives that we need to build so so how are we going to restructure these so that we can build our collective capabilities to be able to go into collective readily, quickly, and easily. Um, and I think I'm running out of time, so I won't I won't say uh, spend too much on this uh, slide. Um, but hopefully, what you might be able to see at a quick glance of it is that there's quite a lot of work already happening here. There's many different groups really digging into some of these questions. These are just a few examples. Um, you know, how can we deal with money differently? How can we budget differently together, participatory? nature how can we really um play with different ways that we can do decision making be really power informed in how we structure that think about the agility of how we need to build our roles embed nature into our legal structure measure from a systemic lens a lived systemic lens um make the shifts in regulation that are needed so these kind of um underlying uh, capabilities of the system to enable collective making um, and so I, I want to end with uh, very greedily two questions <laughs> um, even though they asked me for one but I couldn't quite you know uh, pick one from the other um, and the first one was um, what does it actually mean for us really to develop en masse the collective capabilities that we need to build collectives collaborate with each other on these huge sort of systemic challenges that we have ahead. Um, and, and alongside that, when we build those collectives, how can we involve our ancestors, future generations, and the wider living world into how we think about what, what make, makes up that collective making and move beyond kind of a negotiation of interests into um, imagining and manifesting uh, alternative futures. Thank you so much. That's all from me. Brilliant. Thank you, Annette. It's a really strong start. Uh, Rachel's put those two questions into the chat, so we'll hold on to those uh, there. And then those of us that are facilitating will need to take them into the rooms with us. Just landing that there for everyone. Um, OK, second up, we have Lorna. Um, Lorna is, uh, works at something called CoLab Dudley. Um, which on their Twitter handle, they describe as a social lab and collective of time rebels, creating the conditions for cultural action rooted in long-term thinking, collective imagination, and regenerative design. 
Um, Lorna describes it. Lorna, Lorna avoids describing herself. I've noticed Lorna. Um, Lorna uses um, lots of doing words. Uh, so she's designing, learning, growing, network weaving, and stewarding regenerative shifts. So there's a lot of movement and process built into that. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to hand over to Lorna, who's going to do our second provocation on why we need collective. Thanks, Susie. Um, and thank you, Annette. Um, as someone who rifles around Dark Matter Labs blogs a lot, it's so heartening to actually hear um, you speaking about that um, and knowing that all of that thinking is going on. It's not just, not just us. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Lorna. I've been working for an organisation called WCBS for 22 years. Um, we're a voluntary sector infrastructure organisation. Um, we've got about 50 staff now um, and we've got a traditional uh, charity structure and governance. So some of that that, that um, Annette was referring to. I'm kind of used to being in that uh, with one foot. Um, but in my time with WCBS, um, I've discovered that I do a thing that I imagine lots of all of you do. Um, and I can't help doing it no matter what I'm working it on. And it's it's systems convening. So I kind of like look around me, whether it's in my, inside my own organisation or um, it, within whichever communities I'm working alongside. And I kind of see there's ways that we could connect things across these boundaries that seem to separate groups, organisations, places and so on. Um, and I kind of look for the opportunities to weave relationships and bring people together to learn together, um, often learning through actual doing as well. Um, so in 2014, I instigated this thing that I called Colab Dudley, probably thanks to um, things I was thinking about with Tessie Britton at the time. Um, and what it's become now is a place based social lab um, based on Dudley High Street, which is where I am now and where this picture was taken on Saturday as some of our wonderful uh, collaborators um, kind of stop people on the street to ask questions. Um, and the Colab Dudley is basically infrastructure to support um, a collective of people who are learning through doing and experimenting. Um, so I've been asked today to uh, give what will now be nine minutes on why we need collectives and what difference do they actually make. And when I got the lovely, lovely speaker brief from Mona and um, Susie, um, I immediately thought I have to lift June Holly's work up for you in case some of you aren't familiar with it. Um, so she's the author of the Network Weaver Handbook and kind of don of everything Network Weaving. Um, you can kind of visit their website there. But I'll also share a few nuggets from uh, kind of our experiences of convening a collective um, through our co-lab study work. And something to say, I am going to use the term time rebels, um, which is uh, a term that we've borrowed from Roman Krasnarik, author of The Good Ancestor. And for us, these are people in Dudley who've taken on the challenge of experimenting with ways to unlock the imagination of local people around long term futures. Um, and yeah, our convening call for Time Rebels was a kind of a tightening of a, a broader collective we'd had before that was just broadly, do you want to come together and make, make change on the high street? Um, so in the Network Weaver Handbook, which was actually published 10 years ago, um, June Holly um, kind of shares in the introduction her interest in systems approaches and the ways that networks or collectives can work to transform systems. And she talks about um, transformation in her view, not being about reform or tinkering and nor being about the kind of revolution that we're traditionally used to hearing about with those at the bottom rising up and overthrowing those in power. She talks about it being deeper changes um, and she refers to Danella Meadows work about changes in deep structures. So um, I'm going to bounce through the three uh, kind of deeper structural changes that June Holly thinks things are changing in as just kind of a way to to structure this uh, kind of little bit of input. So the first shift she talks about is um, how we relate to each other from hierarchy to peers working together to co-create a world that works for all. Um, and in a chapter on network leadership, which I think is chapter two of the handbook, um, she kind of draws out some of the differences between traditional organisational leadership and network leadership. So I've clustered a few of them here for you. Um, and you can clearly see that you know, our traditional ways of working, we might have a few leaders um, and really what they do is direct action and they plan and they evaluate. Um, whereas in a kind of network or collective way of organising, um, everyone can be a leader and um, people self-organise. The activity might be much more emergent 
and there is definitely a focus on kind of experimentation and learning through reflection, just as some examples. Um, I actually think there's quite a lot possible on the spectrum between those two spaces. Um, and what I've managed to do over the last year, because of kind of gaining the confidence in doing the work through Colab Dudley, I've been bringing some of the tactics into my organisation. Um, and I've been running an inquiry with um, 10 of my colleagues or from different teams across my organisation around how we work with people in our organisation. And um, these are just a few of the quotes uh, from, we've kind of been nearly a year in now. Um, and we, I started, asking them kind of because of what we've been learning and what they've been trying, what, what they felt was more possible. Um, so these are a few of the things that were said. And the thing that I found most interesting in that session, I have to say, was that um, I'd invited them to do lots of reflection and learning from each other and looking at their own work and then to devise experiments around their work with people. And they told me uh, a few months ago that they'd never used the idea of experimentation in their work. And that in doing it, it opened up so much for them and it made them feel freer and OK to kind of have a go at things and feel much more creative. So I think that in itself, <laughs> traditional organisations have potentially uh, got, got something they could tap into there. Um, so uh, the second shift that Jean Holly talks about is a shift from kind of pressures of conformity to a much deeper appreciation of our differences and the ability to use those to make breakthroughs in our co-creative processes. I just have to point out these guys on this slide, they're um, our stitches in time and they are just brilliant. We <laughs> were with them on Saturday as well. Um, so this image is a visual representation on the wall of the space that I'm sitting at the moment on Dudley High Street and it's where we've stuck these uh, kind of time rebel experiment flowers with petals of possibility all around them and um, that, that's kind of what's become possible by doing these experiments with Time Rebels, by trying to unlock imagination and long-term thinking. And what our Time Rebels have told us is that by focusing on the potential in people and a place and shifting away from trying to find solutions to challenges, it's actually opened up new pathways um, to possibilities and alternative futures for them. And at the level of their experiments or projects or creative interventions, um, they've kind of started to illustrate these new possibilities through their own acts of co-creation and collaboration that start to actually change the narrative and the narratives um, that are kind of emerging and obviously there's loads all around us all of the time um, but what we're kind of seeing is much more interaction between the past, present and future narratives that kind of weave those together and narratives which embrace a much more entangled relationship with nature and the more than human. And then there's been um, kind of more possibilities grown by intentional building of relationships and peer learning networks between what we're doing locally and then larger movements for change. So it was a personal one, yeah, big up to the donor economics learning journeys. Being part of that for eight of us in Dudley has been uh, kind of game changing in terms of how, what we think is possible and what creative action local residents have actually been taking on their streets, around their houses, um, in their gardens, um, in their neighbourhoods and so on. Um, so the third uh, and final one that I'll touch on from June is uh, this kind of shift from control mentality to a creation of a web of support that enables us to find others, communicate easily, access resources and reflect on our work. Um, and we've again discovered, because we bring the time rebels together to reflect um, on what they've learned, um, they have all noticed, or maybe not all, but they've talked about a growth in their creative confidence opening up to ideas around long-term thinking and how to be a good ancestor um, an expansion of their own practices of learning and doing together and kind of more meaningful connection to creative networks so um, you know all, all of this comes when you kind of use collectives as a way of organizing and um, support them well and this is an example of uh, we one of our ways of learning we call it our learning kind of doing detectorism um, just to make it sound fun and for local people to join in without feeling like their researchers, which doesn't sound so inviting at all to, to a lot of people. Um, and we've been developing uh, our detectorism approach to what we call detectorism in the wild, so that people with all different kinds of worldviews and uh, experiences can bring their own ways of learning to this, whether it's that they learn through movement. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, this isn't about kind of research written word, it's research in whatever form, audio recordings, um, bringing all of our 
different histories and pasts to what we do. Um, I was asked to also briefly touch on um, kind of any difficulties and challenges. Um, I'll just flag up a few here. Uh, kind of when you move into the space of working in collectives, uh, I'd say one thing is that you haven't got the kind of protection you might have from challenging behaviours and so on. Um, you've, you've not got HR or policies to lean back on. Not that we even have HR in my organisation, it's a small organisation, but there are still things that could protect you that you have to kind of navigate through without. Um, Teams and network edges are quite permeable, permeable so there's lots of change and flux, um, which can be good <laughs> when there's problems um, and you want to move things around, but it can be a bit disorienting when thing you thought that you thought you knew what was going on and then it changes. A um, few things, problems I have is the kind of people looking in at the work that are maybe more used to the traditional organisations. Um, they probably think that you're going to deliver services, but probably you're not. You're creating conditions for people to do things themselves, so stay with it. Um, people will ask you what your vision is and you might be wanting to say well there are lots of visions being held across this collective and we're going to qu keep contesting them and keep debating them and always have many and that is cool. Um, I think it, the, I mean the biggest challenge really is understanding that the change you're making kind of how you understand it looks and feels different and we've fallen on principles focused evaluation which Michael Quinn Patton champions um, and uh, we found that super helpful. So I would point everyone to that um, if they're kind of diving into this space. And then the other one back to June Holly, um, the, the, in kind of bringing this, like where this is now of kind of bringing a collective together, JRF are doing the act of kind of acting as a central hub, which you need, but you don't want to keep all the time. So you have to be thinking about how you're going to move out of the centre to have a kind of a multi-hub network and then growing your kind of core periphery model so you've got as much kind of edges around the side where innovation can come in and things can percolate in and out of your network or collective. Um, so, talking too fast, <laughs> my provocation to you uh, is drawn from one of our five guiding principles that we uh, understand our change around and we have one called Nurture Connections. So we wanted you to maybe join us if you wish to in considering how we might create the conditions for meaningful connections that animate multiple and diverse peer networks that are shaped by reciprocity, creativity, care and interdependence. And thank you for listening. Brilliant, thank you Lorna. Um, that was yeah, lovely to hear you talk about it and also to have the, to have the people on the screen <laughs> makes a huge difference to actually see the faces. Um, okay, provocation three is Katie. Katie works at NEON and the tagline they have at NEON is um, helping social justice movements to win. Um, they offer, among other things, uh, hands-on support and training for campaigners, organisers, communications and operations teams working across social movements and within that Katie's head of movement organising. Uh, she is looking at how, so she's looking at the practical, some of the practical questions around how we build collectives. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Katie. Awesome. Right, I'll share my screen. Cool. Can folks see that? You're all good. Brilliant. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you about some of the nuts and bolts um, of building a collective or how we bring a group of individuals together um, to effectively implement change collectively. Um, so I, my background is definitely more of that kind of unbound space in movements um, and so also in unions for quite a long time. So I think a lot of the examples that I'm going to draw on and what we talk about is much more from that that yeah un, unbound kind of collective collective world. Um, so there's lots of different areas to unpick when we think about what goes uh, into building effective collectives, um, including how do we ensure the right people are in the room how as a group we make decisions or how we hold one another accountable. Um, so in my experience when working across collectives and communities, either professionally or in a grassroots space, the one thing that's helped groups be success successful and sustainable is culture. So culture is also the thing that often helps us do all the other things our groups want to do well. So culture is the foundation on which effective collectives are built. There we go. Um, but what do I mean when I say culture? So culture, um, this really nice quote here says that culture is the emotional backdrop to our organisations and our groups. It's how we behave together, how we treat one another, um, our shared attitudes and our shared values. 
At its best, culture creates a supportive foundation for us to come together, providing us with a common understanding of the types of behavior and approaches everyone within the, the collective can expect from everyone else, regardless of rank, power, positionality, or seniority. It's important that we recognize and value culture as a strategic tool that plays an integral role in creating social change. And probably quite unexpectedly, I'm gonna pivot for a little bit and talk about the far right. Um, so the man on the screen, he looks quite angry, is a guy called Christopher Cantwell. Uh, so Cantwell is a white nationalist and he ended up being one of the self-elected speakers for the American-based hate collective, Unite the Right. Um, so the collective organized a rally in Charlottesville that brought together uh, white nationalists, neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and a range of far-right militias in the hope of unifying America's white nationalist movement um, in sort of the late, it was like 2017. There's a lot of when the sort of protests around Charlottesville and a lot of the kind of um, stuff that went on around Trump was kind of going on. Um, and in an interview that Campwell did talking about kind of mobilization and movement building. He said this about the far right. We don't have the camaraderie, we don't have the trust level that our rivals do. And that's built up through activism. And that's one of the tactics that we're adopting. People realize that they're not atomized individuals, they're part of a whole. So when we get bogged down in the doing work of our collectives, um, and we often overlook, um, we are, and the often overlooked and under-resourced work of creating and maintaining a group's culture slides even further down the list of things to prioritize. It's really important to remember that the far right in their mobilizing and their building recognize that what makes progressive social movements and the change that we create really effective um, and really powerful is the idea of creating a deliberate culture that pivots around camaraderie and trust. So essentially ethno-nationalism just on its own isn't cutting it anymore. Uh, to sustain their movement, the far right are looking to more progressive movements to see what they can learn and how they can build a community. And at times it often feels like they're winning because they're now putting a lot of thought and action into, into how they do that and how do they grow their movements. We're going to move off the angry far right man now um, and talk about something a little bit more pleasant. Um, so building a strong culture in the collectives that we operate in is a radical political act. It allows us to create and demonstrate alternative ways of being and doing in the world that act in resistance to the dominant and oppressive systems that the work we do often tries to counter. A strong culture helps us challenge competition, individualism, disposability, control, compliance, the list goes on. We're often unconscious of the culture around us unless we're intentional about examining it and constructing it. After all, culture is the water that we swim in and what we're conditioned by. So this quote on the screen um, is it taken from um, a Canadian philosopher, Marshall McLuhan, and he says, we don't know who discovered the water, but we know it wasn't the fish. So your groups and the collectives that you're building will have a culture regardless of whether or not you try and create one, like that will just develop. Um, and it might not be the culture that you want, and it might not be the right culture for the group. So collectives, groups, and organizations are made up of individuals. We all bring our own experiences and ways of being into that space. So it's helpful to think about culture when we're working in groups focused on social change as the ways in which we relate to one another rooted in our values and beliefs. So Stuart Hall also described culture as a critical site of social action and intervention where power relations are both established and potentially unsettled. Another way of thinking about culture, the culture of our groups and our collectives is as a living system. Uh, it's not simply the, the, the things that we do and that we say we do, but it's everything that actually happens within that group or that network or that collective. And we can seek to choose and create the versions of these systems that we want within our own collectives. But if we don't act deliberately, those systems will likely take the shape that is inherited from the dominant culture. So once we've chosen these systems and, and how we want our kind of cultures to be and how we want our, our networks um, and collectives to be, we must nurture and tend to them to help them evolve and grow. As without doing, uh, without ongoing care, they can slip into systems that, that kind of exist from the dominant culture. And we'll all have been in those spaces, whether it's either in our paid work, our unpaid work, or in our social lives, where as much as we believe and care about the issue that we're working on and the work that's being done, something in that group of people just hasn't felt right. And we've, we've stepped away from that space because it hasn't nurtured us and our, partic and our participation in it. 
Um, and that could be because you're feeling overburdened by actions and commitments that clash with your personal life or you don't feel that you can bring your kind of like personal self into that space. Uh, different ways the groups handle decision making or conflict or access to information. I know I've definitely stepped back from groups when the culture hasn't felt right and I've not had the energy or the time or the passion to want to really change it. Um, I know I always feel really disappointed in myself when I do that, but a lot of the time that's happened is because that group hasn't been intentional about its culture setting and its ways it wants to work together. And that's why thinking about a group's culture from the start and continuing to be explicit and deliberate about it, nurturing it and allowing it to change and develop when new people come in is so integral to building and sustaining groups that we want to bring about social change. And sorry, it's maybe slightly grainy, but it's Toy Story, which is always good. Um, but we can't talk about culture without talking about anti-oppression, um, because whether we not whether we like it or not, power runs through our groups and our collectives, often further marginalising people and replicating the very systems we want to challenge. So it's important that when we're discussing our group's culture, we're not shying away from discussions about power and systems of power and how those dynamics might play out in our spaces. And this means taking practical steps to address power and oppression within our group, thinking about the needs of those in the room and those who want to be in the room. Oppression will continue to show up in our movements and in our networks and our collectives unless we consciously address it. Therefore, anti-oppression should be part of everything we do, not siloed away from the rest of the work. It should be something that we practice every day. We will never be done learning and we will always make mistakes and that's okay. Like it's part of the learning process. And anti-oppression is, is central to our success. We will not create the change we want to see if we continue to uphold the levers of the broken systems that we're challenging. So I'm gonna pop my prompts up on the screen. Um, so returning to the original question of how can we build collectives? Um, culture is an integral strategic tool to not only build collectives, but also enacting change by creating a version of the world that we want to live in. So when you kind of head to the broader discussions, I've left you, I've been cheeky and left you with a reflection and a question. Um, so I want you to kind of spend a few seconds reflecting on when you've experienced a, f a culture that's felt good. Like, has it been in a workspace? Has it been in some organizing or a social activity? And I'd also invite you to consider that if you've never had to think deliberately about the culture and dynamics of a group or collective that you're part of, it's possible that you're benefiting from whatever status quo that group is upholding. And I think probably taking a step back and being able to kind of critique and be like, hey, actually that's not felt right, or who is that culture not felt right for, and who is that excluded in the space is really important. And so it could be like, ways that work colleagues have facilitated a meeting uh, that allows everyone to speak without fear, or it could be the way that a grassroots community group you're part of takes time every year to celebrate the group's birthday with a wider network of friends and co-conspirators while eating a delicious and questionably decorated cake. Um, and then I'd like you to kind of take those reflections and help you answer kind of the question in the room, um, which is what actions um, can we take to deliberately create an anti-oppressive culture? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That, that, the, yeah, decorating is definitely questionable. Not my key takeaway, but I'm going to agree with you. Um, okay, in answer to the questions that are on chat, I think Rachel answered, but yes, we will be sharing, I presume, I haven't actually checked that with Katie Lorna and um, Annette, but I think we're okay to share the slides afterwards. We'll build them into the reference library and also circulate in post event synthesis. Um, I, we have a 10 minute break. To do some of the reflecting that Katie has invited us to do, um, do step away from your computers and stretch your legs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then come back here at let's say 12:50. Um, the oh, I just had a panic that I couldn't read the clock then, but I can at 12:50, um, and I'll take us into the next stage. Then I'll probably go for about five minutes and then be in here if anyone wants to come back in and chat in that little bit after, before we come back formally. Okay. Remember to keep yourselves on mute and turn your videos off if you're doing any video in the background. Good luck. 